Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, Fiona. That was a lovely welcome. Gosh, I hope we can live up to that billing. So, look, thank you, everyone, for taking the time to come. I mean, you've all taken time and travel time to come out of your practices. It's not just us. It's you as well. And this is this is about health education, and it's a two-way street. I was a GP in Christchurch, so I'm very well aware that there are differences in the way we can practice, the access to to um, investigations and tests. And as I say, it's, it's two-way. It's not just us about about us educating you, it's the other way around too, so that together, hopefully, we make progress for our patients. Now, just, you've heard the introduction to Megan and myself, we actually belong to a larger group, the Reproductive Endocrine Group at Fertility Associates, so you can see that we've got two other, probably younger, more glamorous models that um, belong, belong to the group, um, and you've heard our affiliations with the Auckland DHB Fertility Associates, which is sort of international now, I guess, and the University of Auckland. And today, just an overview, we loosely divided this day, which is really about reproductive health issues in women. So it's very good to see some men here. Um, so the morning is really about issues that relate to premenopausal women. So we're going to start with amenorrhea, um, puberty and amenorrhea, and then we're going to drill down a bit in some of the most common reasons that someone might present to you with irregular or loss of periods. So that's then hypothalamic amenorrhea, polycystic ovary syndrome, and what used to be called early or premature menopause and now has a more PC name of premature ovarian insufficiency or POI. Afternoon, we're essentially devoted to menopause. I think this is an area that there is a lot of controversy. We had a very poor quality study, the WHI, which you'll all be aware of. And in fact, that's 17 years ago that study was published. But somehow the fallout, the ramifications from WHI have coloured practice, particularly in primary care. And I'm hoping by the end of the day, we're going to have given you a lot more confidence about taking taking the reins back up in terms of managing menopausal women. You'll have a lot of women in your practice who are menopausal and it's really important that by and large these women are, are managed in primary care rather than by specialists. So let's just get straight into the first presentation which is amenorrhea. Now if it suited everyone, if we're a relatively small group, but what we'd quite like to do is perhaps go through the presentations. We haven't made them the entire length of the time and then there'll be plenty of time for questions and we're also very open to questions at morning tea and at, and at lunch as well. So amenorrhea and really trying to sort of do quick and dirty, I mean it's all very well for Megan and I, we have an hour with a new patient and more, if, probably more if we need it, you've got to try and sort someone out in 10 or 15 minutes. So you need some quick pointers to what you should be thinking about. You need to know what's normal and abnormal. So with that, I just wanted to begin with puberty. And this is an area I think there's a lot of misconception about what is normal and what's abnormal. So first of all, just to divide the difference, make sure you all understand the difference between these sort of slightly dodgy terms, adrenarche and pu puberty or pubarche. So adrenarche is when the adrenal gland starts to produce adrenal relatively weak adrenal androgens, DHEAS, if you want the actual terminology, and girls start to get secondary sex here and that can occur before or after breast budding but it is not puberty all right that is just adrenarche um, often there's a little bit of acne or at least oily skin and as i say six months either, either side usually of true puberty so the first sign of true puberty in a female is breast budding is everyone clear about that does it does do people know what the first sign of true puberty in a male is anyone got any ideas shall i give you a pointer below the waist. <laughs> yeah, ab absolutely. So so a young, anxious um, adolescent male can come in to see me and basically a um, examination with the um, endocrinologist rosary beads or <laughs> prado orchiometer. If the testicles are greater than four or five mils, puberty's on the way, no more tests needed to be done. So that's for boys. For girls, it's breast budding. So looking, you know, being familiar with the tanner stages and being aware of the difference between just a little bit of fat tissue and true breast budding is important. And then growth is another feature. So really important to distinguish between those two. Now, the median age in New Zealand for tanner to breast development is actually just under the age of 10. And I think that surprises people. So that's really important when you're deciding what is delayed, or in fact what's early, and the median age of menarche is actually 13. Okay, so that's just important to know. And by, if we use confidence li limits, by 15, 
almost every girl who is normal will have achieved menarche. So there is no place for telling a girl who is more than 15 that her absent periods or dodgy periods are just because she's a teenager, all right? And I'm afraid we hear that far too often in clinical practice. So those are, I just wanted to emphasize that because that's, I think that's really important. Should have had periods, should have had the first period by the age of 15, and in fact, by 10, it, the, the, the me, it's the median age for breast budding. So certainly by 13, it's going to be late. So this brings you back to when, when should you be concerned? When do you need to think about referral? So if we use the 95 centiles referral criteria, a girl who has no breast budding by the age of 13 is significantly delayed, all right? And a girl who is not menstruating by the age of 15 is delayed. So I, I, just, I just wanted to use the opportunity because I think that is a common area that there is um, a complacency in, in general, but certainly in primary care, which needs to be addressed. And I've, I've suggested some things, if there's no breast budding, so there's no pubertal signs by 13, an FSH measurement is extremely easy because this could be a girl with premature ovarian insufficiency or gonadal dysgenesis. And I, same thing for failure to menstruate by 15. Pelvic ultrasound is of course to make sure she's actually got a uterus. Yeah. So the practice points as I've mentioned, these referrals are often delayed and it seems that just in general, in general terms, people don't appreciate the difference between not having your period but still having had pubertal signs and actually not having any signs of puberty. So they're, they're two separate things and they're important for you to, to establish. And of course it can be quite difficult if you're a male GP and you're asking a girl to, um, you know, to raise her shirt and have a look. I mean there are other ways around that. You could show her some tanner charts and ask her to point to where she is. But in general, one does need examination. So let's then move on to amenorrhea or lack of periods. So just a little reminder of what's going on in the reproductive axis. Now, I think, let's just uh, see, yep, here we go. So I think you're all aware that you've got gonadotrophin releasing hormone coming from the hypothalamus, which in turn drives the pituitary to make the gonadotrophins, LH and FSH, which in turn drives the gonad. All right, and the function of the female gonad is to make an egg and to make estrogen. All right, so estrogen is going to progress puberty. The egg doesn't really matter until you want a baby. Now, the new area that you may not be aware of has anyone heard of the cuspeptin axis? Cute. Cute we name. So this has come from some fabulous work coming out of um, Harvard and Mass General um, by a wonderful reproductive endocrinologist called Bill Crowley, if anyone wants to look at the work. So has basically um, sorted out that the missing gap between what's going on in the brain, perhaps in, in terms of adipose tissue, in terms of signaling about energy, is the connection with kispeptin. So kispeptin in turn drives GnRH. So there's one more step in that process, all right? And that's actually been a very important discovery in, um, in reproductive endocrinology. So thinking about amenorrhea, there's two ways that are relatively straightforward to think about it. You can think about it at anatomical level in that diagram I've just shown you. So is the problem up top? Is the problem um, in the ovary? Is the problem even below the ovary? or one can think about it in terms of the hormonal changes. So if we think about the anatomical level, there, there are various things that could be going on in the brain, hypothalamus and pituitary, some of which could be congenital. Have people ever heard of the name Kalman syndrome or idiopathic hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism or HH? So that's just when someone congenitally doesn't have, um, doesn't produce LH and FSH. Okay, and sometimes that's associated with less lo loss of sense of smell. That can also be acquired if you've got a if you've got a structural lesion, um, if you've got a um, craniopharyngioma, or you've got a big pituitary adenoma sitting on the pituitary gland or compressing the stalk. You might acquire that lesion, so it can be acquired or it can be congenital. And then, of course, it can be what we call functional. And this is probably the one that we see the most of, but is again often overlooked. So hypothalamic amenorrhea is when, and we're going to talk in more detail about this, but when you've acquired a gonadotrophin deficiency, particularly a deficiency of LH, because there's simply not enough energy being consumed for the brain to think that a girl is, is, um, is um, healthy enough to have a baby. 
So she basically stops producing GnRH, stops producing LH, stops signaling to her ovary that she can produce estrogen and eggs, so stops ovulating. So that is, in general terms, the girl who's perhaps lost weight, who's doing a lot of exercise, who's not compensating for the weight loss and the exercise by increasing energy. It's our clean eaters, a lot of our athletes. All right. And, and of course, stress and some congenital factors come into that. So that's what I mean by functional hypothalamic amenorrhea. Now, if we move further down to the ovary, obviously we can have PCOS, and it's not uncommon in PCOS to actually have late menarche. Uh, gonadal dysgenesis, now, the prototype, if you like, is Turner syndrome. Does, has everyone got perhaps at least one patient in their practice with Turner syndrome? Um, so that is when you've missing one, one of your two X chromosomes, one is, one is missing completely. So it's an XO uh, phenotype or, and karyotype. But you can also have much more minor changes of that second X chromosome, even a girl who's actually got some Y chromosome material. And it can all present in a similar way, often not just with um, early loss of periods or, or premature menopause, but actually delayed puberty. So that's what we mean by the gonadal dysgenesis, and it's a sort of umbrella term. Um, and premature ovarian failure, or POI, can occur at any age. I mean, Megan and I have patients who are 13, when they, so they've had one period and it stops. And again, what is really, um, really concerned to us, I guess, as reproductive endocrinologists is the lack of awareness that this can happen to a teenager. So. Menopause isn't just something that happens to older women. It can happen to adolescents, and the frequency might be one in 100 at 40, one in 1,000 at 30, perhaps one in 10,000 at 20, but we certainly see them, quite a lot of patients, and it's really distressing when a patient, they've perhaps had some blood tests, the, the answer's there with an elevated FSH, nothing has been said to the patient, and then they're referred to meet a specialist they've never met before, and you have to deliver this news. So it's such a simple test to do to measure the gonadotrophins. So just make, you will see that occasionally, it's important to be aware of that. Now in terms of anatomy, um, Mayer-Rogatansky syndrome is where someone's actually born without a uterus, so they're going to go through a normal puberty, but they can't menstruate because they don't have a uterus. Again, pretty devastating news. So there'll be normal hormones, um, normal pubertal development, and it's the pelvic ultrasound that would pick that up. Mm -hmm. And obviously anything further below that. Um, obstruction is something that occurs, tends to be a bit later on. Someone's had something done like a poorly carried out um, or repeated curatage. And we don't do that as much as we used to. I mean, every abnormal bleeding 10 or 20 years ago got a DNC, and then sometimes that just um, really the endometrium would get um, infected and inflamed and, and start to stick together so someone wouldn't menstruate. So obstruction's a possibility. Someone's had radiotherapy or perhaps some surg surgery to, to the vaginal area, that, but it's uncommon, but just something to think about. Now, if you, just let me go back. Yeah, so if you instead thought, thought about it in terms of the hormones, the LH and FSH, and that's where we get the World Health Organization mm. definition. So I think you'd have probably all had that in your medical school training, d dividing people into group one, which are the basically low to normal FSH, low estrogen, normal prolactin. Group two, which is normal estrogen, normal gonadotrophins, normal prolactin, that's more the PCO group, whereas the first group are the, are the hypothalamic group. And then group three are the raised gonadotrophin, so that's the premature ovarian insufficiency, premature menopause group. So that's another way of doing it. And so just looking at that from the point of view of primary care, um, the first thing you always have to do, despite patient's denial of possibility of being pregnant, is to do a beta HCG. And, and I think, you know, that's something that all of us miss, and probably as specialists, we don't think we're exempt from that. You know, so, so obviously a beta HCG for just about everyone, unless there are none, uh, perhaps, um, is, is an important test. But otherwise, if you do on one blood test, um, perhaps a morning fasting blood test, so the, the prolactin's as low as you can get it, gonadotrophins, prolactin and thyroid function, you're going to actually be able to, with those very simple and inexpensive tests, put people into these four groups, which is going to be the majority of your patients. There's always going to be the occasional patient that's more difficult, and don't worry, we have patients that we 
have trouble designating. But using the gonadotrophin, so, so PCO, you're going to have a normal to an increased LH. Hypothalamic amenorrhea, often the FSH is normal, but the LH is lower than the FSH, often quite low. And I think people don't often appreciate that relationship. Um, hyperprolactinemia, and we are going to talk about prolactin, which, but obviously you can have suppressed gonadotrophins because your prolactin is raised, so you must do the prolactin. And again, it's surprising how many referrals the prolactin is missing in the initial workup. So um, you look pretty smart if you've diagnosed the, uh, pr the, uh, pituit the um, pituitary pr um, prolactinoma. And then as mentioned, although it's uncommon, you will see it and you must do an FSH and recognize the importance of an elevated FSH. Now, of course, an FSH and LH could be elevated if, if someone's ovulating. So you would always repeat those tests on two or three occasions. But an ovulatory set of gonadotrophins, you're going to have a higher LH than FSH, whereas with menopause, you're going to have a higher FSH than LH. And again, it would be repeated. You'd, it would be seen on repeated tests. Now, these are tests, and this is going to depend on availability. So depending on when you practice, what availability you've got, particularly for good quality ultrasound. Um, and so I haven't suggested them as first line, but it can be very helpful um, if we want... There we go, yeah. So an estradiol that is low with a lowish LH certainly is pointing in the, in the direction of hypothalamic amenorrhea. Testos testosterone is not always going to be elevated with PCOS, but a high testosterone is certainly going to point to in that direction. Uh, there are lots of reasons that the pelvic ultrasound could be useful. Now, karyotype, it's really interesting. Our gynecology colleagues, I hope there's no one in the room with gynecology, always seem to do a karyotype for every irregular period, but in fact the only purpose of that is in the POI situation. So that's the only time that you're going to see something abnormal with either a Y chromosome or um, a missing X. So just karyotypes are not often very helpful. Now, I wanted just to show you a couple of cases, just, just to sort of work through the sort of things that we might be thinking about. So here we have Izzy, who presents having had a menarche at a reasonably normal age at 14. She had regular periods, and then they stopped two years ago. She has, she, she has two years of secondary amenorrhea. And she denies any rec recent weight loss, although you can see she's a pretty lean girl. But Two years ago or so, she started, she upped her exercise, she thought she'd do a little bit of competition and she became a runner and was running reasonable distances. I often ask patients um, the um, time it takes them to run 10Ks and gives me an idea of their general fitness. So for those of you that are athletes, I mean, patient who's denying they're doing much exercise but can get through a 10K run in 50 minutes is pretty fit and doing a lot. So I find that quite helpful. So on examination, she looks perfectly healthy. There's nothing obviously wrong. She's got a BMI that's 19. Um, she doesn't seem to have androgen excess symptoms. Um, she it doesn't have milk coming from her breasts. Um, she doesn't have a goiter or any evidence of thyroid disease. You have looked at her visual fields, and the reason I've looked at her visual fields, I mean, it's a very simple test to do. Yeah, just just mass, just just to exclude, and, and perhaps medical legally, it just means you have considered the possibility, particularly if you haven't got access to MRI or the patient doesn't want it. So you have thought about mass lesions, um, perhaps asked her about headaches and visual problems and checked her visual fields. And she doesn't look like she's got a functioning pituitary tumour. So, the, you know, signs of acromegaly or, or Cushing, things like that, can actually be quite subtle. And don't worry, we miss them too. So, you know, just, just a passing thought to what could be going on in the pituitary within the setting. So she has a set of investigations. So let's just run through them. So we've excluded pregnancy. Comments here? FSHs? Is, is that normal? Yes, under 10. So that's normal. So you've excluded POI already. And her LH is sort of low normal. And, and I think that's often overlooked. It, it, what the lab will say is that that normal is 0 to 10. But that is actually relatively low, and it's quite a lot lower than the FSH. Her estrogen of 100. No. Yeah, it is. And again, depends where you are in the cycle. But in conjunction with that history and that lowish LH, you've got, you're starting to build a picture, aren't you, of a low LH, low estrogen situation. Her prolactin is totally normal, her TSH is normal, and her testosterone is mid-normal range. Okay? 
Now, she does, she comes to see us, so she does get a good quality ultrasound, and she's got polycystic ovary morphology. Now, that means she's got follicles in the ovaries, and we've stopped worrying about whether they're peripheral or right through the ovaries. Depends on the quality of the ultrasound, but let's say she's got at least 12 follicles and one or more ovaries. Um, her ovarian volumes, now this is something that you won't be used to looking at, but is actually a very helpful finding. So normal is up to about eight or nine mils. So often the radiologist will report a volume greater than that as normal, but in fact, it's a bigger volume. And a large volume ovary, if there isn't a dominant follicle or a cyst or, 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 or a dermoid in it, is a certainly a hint towards polycystic ovary, um, true polycystic ovaries. So she's got the morphology, but she's got normal volume ovarian volumes. And the endometrium is another thing that you won't be used to seeing, but you'll get that in the report. And that's, I'll tell you, that's a very thin endometrium. And a thin endometrium suggests what in terms of hormones? Anyone have a punt at that? If you haven't got much endometrium, you haven't got much Oestrogen, yeah, because you have to have oestrogen to grow the to grow the endometrium, and you've got to have progesterone to tighten the coils, and then lose your progesterone and shed it. Does that make sense? So all hinting and a consistent picture of a rather low oestrogen state. Reasonable. Now let's just think about the PCO morphology, and I guess the point I want to make to you here is that it is common, and it's non-specific. It does not equal polycystic ovary syndrome, all right? And the younger the patient, the more common this finding. So we have a patient who is not looking like she's got PCOS clinically or in terms of her blood tests, but we got the PCO morphology. But when we looked harder at the ultrasound, she had a thin endometrium and she didn't have big ovaries. Would you be happy with that? So just, just to be aware, aware of that, um, Conversely, if you haven't got radiologists who are good at looking at it, you can miss it. So I never take any notice of a, a patient who's perhaps been up at A&E with abdominal pain and had a emergency department pelvic ultrasound, and I hope there's no radiologist here thinking I'm being rude, but you know, and it just says normal pelvic ultrasound. That is not ruling out PCO morphology either for that matter. So let's coming back to Izzy. So we've ruled out that her prolactin, she's not pregnant, her prolactin is normal, and she doesn't have premature ovarian insufficiency. So we're down to hypothalamic amenorrhea or lean PCOS. And I think I've led you hopefully in the right direction. Well, who thinks it's hypothalamic amenorrhea? Okay, anyone think it's lean PCOS? Okay, yep. And this is a table, and. I think at the end of the day, there's always going to be patients you're wondering, which, and, and that includes us. We tend to be pretty honest. If we're not certain, we say to a patient, we're leaving an open mind. And in fact, we have patients in our practice who will have an overlap situation, who will actually have both conditions with one predominating. All right. But just thinking about the things that we've been discussing, signs and biochemistry of androgen excess, what the LH is doing, the morphology of the ovaries, the endometrial thickness, History, and this is where you might come back to the history, not just in a bit more detail about exercise, what their eating plan is, how much stress they've got going on. Thinking about BMI and being aware that hypothalamic amenorrhea, while a patient is usually towards the leaner end, it can certainly happen in someone whose BMI is more than that. And in fact, a patient I saw on Wednesday had a BMI of 24. So don't rule that possibility out and we've just talked about oestrogen levels, but that, that sort of thinking about that table and the differences can help you in that slightly tricky situation. So we've decided that Izzy's got hypothalamic amenorrhea, and I think we've built a good, if we looked at the data carefully, we've got the case for that. So what are we going to do for her? We're going to carefully look at nutrition. In, for Megan and myself in Auckland, we're very fortunate to have a wonderful multidisciplinary team. So we've got access, which many of you will not have, to really expert academic nutritionists who, who specialise in um, sports physiology and working out energy assessments and, you know, how, how to really demonstrate to the patient, particularly when they've taken up a sport, you know, how they've, how they've got a deficit in terms of energy in. And Megan will refer quite a lot more to that in her talk. So we're going to give her advice probably about stopping her exercise or certainly switching to less, less intense, more days off, 
more cross training and, and preferably, I mean, my patients, I'll be telling them to take up, you know, they can, they can do yoga and Pilates and they need to stop the running, eat more, stop worrying about clean, clean eating and gain a little bit of weight. Can be very challenging advice, we'll come back to that.